Guys, welcome to this very different setting for the barbershop. And unlike most panel discussions, which will go, Hey, Prachi, what about this? Hey, Dunkel, now it's your turn. Mm. I'm just going to drop questions in the air and you guys can pick them up. I didn't like scan the GDP. I wouldn't be building a hair care brand. I'd go into Web3 or something. To be fairly honest, we did not put in a lot of our own personal savings into the business. On the phone, I can't make out the difference. Their voices sound. <laughs> it's very important to select your investors because these are folks who will be with you for a long time. Surrounded by more women is a much better place to be. Know the worth of what you are bringing to the table. There's a lot of sales which happens in every part yeah. of your life as a founder. You are selling your product of course, selling to get people on board on your team. You are also selling to an investor to be able to get them on board. So the less... selling soul also like a little. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Guys, welcome to this, uh, you know, uh, very different setting for the barbershop. Thank you so much. And unlike most panel discussions, which will go, hey Prachi, what about this? <laughs> and hey Dunkel, now it's your turn. We're going to do air time. And Nikhil, I'm just going to drop questions in the air. Yeah. And you guys can pick them up. We have two founders who have raised early stage capital. And of course, someone who does early stage capital for a living. <laughs> um, and I'm going to start this off uh, with asking probably the most important question that I had to answer when I raised our first round many, many years ago, which is how do you choose the right time to raise capital as a founder, right? Many people, in fact, most people in this audience are founders, um, having raised capital or not. I fundamentally struggled and I continue to struggle with having clarity of deployment when raising beforehand because most investors will ask and you should ask, correct this if I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. We'll ask, where are you going to spend yeah. it? Yeah. Right? And you don't know the answer to that. And the honest answer is, I don't know. Right? They can get bank with Abhi Nihe to Padani, right? So, uh, how do you guys figure out what's the right time to raise capital? Yeah. yeah. I, can, I can go first. Yes. So, um, I think it'll, it'll definitely vary based on what category you're building in. Uh, for me, and I, I remember getting very good advice from Shalab Gupta, yeah. you know, uh, who built Akiva. So he said, like, you should, you should raise at the point where you feel you really need the money to be able to do anything at all. Yeah. Up until that point, just bootstrap, right? Focus on uh, strategy, focus on execution, focus on getting kind of the foundation set. Uh, even for hiring, he gave me the same advice. Yeah. He was like, when you get to a point where calm karne ke liye you need people, only do it then. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. It is very time consuming, mm. right? Uh, it takes... A lot of time just to do all of the networking and the hustle and refining the pitch and then the paperwork. Oh my good God! Uh -huh. um, so, uh, so it will be it will be time consuming, right? And uh, having said that, you have to you have to get it done and you have to spend the time finding the right folks. But uh, you should do it when you really feel like you need the money. I think for us, we needed it even to get off the ground, yeah. uh, not only to scale. My savings were not enough for me to be able to launch. So we we raised kind of post product development, but pre launch uh, a couple of months ago. Mm -hmm. We had the products in hand, we had the basics of our brand in place, uh, but we felt even to go to market, you know, it, it wasn't going to happen. Uh, yeah. So that is how we took the call. Yeah. Okay. What about I you? I think how we thought about it is that in, in, in our minds, there are two points to raise funds. One <coughs> is to kind of prove that this business or this idea works, like there is some, there is some ray of hope in this idea, which I would maybe call product market fit. Okay. So there's some amount of money I need to show success, initial success and product market fit in the market to my consumers and then there's capital to kind of just grow and expand and market. In my mind, I think the first step was you need to see how much money you need just to get that product market fit and that's the call we took that in order to maybe able to have so many products launched in the market and be able to sell XY units. I'll probably need so much capital. I'll need some capital for inventory. I'll need some capital for marketing. I'll probably need to hire a few people. And that's how I did the back calculation of, in order to be able to show at least some early signs of success, this is the amount of money I need. And, and that's how we decided that 
this is the right time to kind of go ahead and just raise it. I think it's also a personal call. So for example, for me, it's much easier to be in the flow of something and get it done. So personally, I think the earlier we raised the capital for product market fit, uh, I personally feel it was better, easier, because once it was done and dusted, all focus, everything just on, on the execution. Yeah, yeah. So for, I think those were the two factors, PMF and uh, yeah. the flow, personal flow. That's very flow. interesting. Prachi, how do you see, how do you see founders who do this well in terms of timing fundraises in terms of not only stage of business, mm -hmm. but also in terms of bandwidth optimization of self? Because typically, very few founders, especially early stage founders, yeah will have the ability to delegate fundraising in any meaningful way. So it's always you doing it, you're also building out the business. So how do you see like best in class fundraising practices? What do good founders do well? So I think what Twinkle mentioned around the two milestones, one which is, you know, you've quit your company or wherever you are and you think that, you know, you want to fundraise or you want to, or you want to, sorry, you want to start up. Uh, at that point of time, there is a, you know, phase where you want to validate what you want to do, right? Which is, does this product really have a market? Um, and you know, how large can it be and so on. So that is the first milestone and it might or might not need capital. It depends on, you know, what kind of sector that you're building in. Uh, you know, since we are here with two, you know, consumer founders, maybe if we were to just <coughs> focus on maybe consumer product companies, whatever it needs for you to be able to get maybe the first sample or the batch of products and to be able to test it at least with a small set of customers. So that is maybe your validation stage. Um, once that is done, the second milestone essentially is your getting to some early signs of product market yeah. fit, which is, you know, by product market fit, we would mean, you know, some customer love. So, you know, very good customer satisfaction score or NPS repeats to some scale, you know, all of those two, three things together. So a lot of times, many founders think about the first milestone that they'd want to do with their own savings because they feel like, hey, you know, I can get to, you know, some sample product or something of that sort by myself. And for the second milestone, I want to then raise, yeah. right? Um, and like you mentioned, uh, I guess fundraising, honestly, I would say with the, all the founders who put all the hard work into, you know, building a product, building a team, fundraising is hard and it takes a lot of time. So whatever helps you to just get done with it and move on to building it, I think is best. So the number of times you can reduce, I guess, yeah. fundraising is probably the best. Can, no. I, can I add to that? I yeah, think, of course. So I was a, a solo founder at the time. So it just, it felt, I think there was a point where it felt like 70% of my time, of my waking hours, just went into this. Mm. Was, it, was it a function of how much work you had to do? Or was it a function of how much it played on your mind? Because there are two different things. Mm. The work I had to do. Okay. But I realized I was going about it in a way and I, I spoke to someone else who, who was saying this to me as well. Um, and I now can't recall who it was. Get help, right? Um, on both fronts, I think there are definitely some things that you absolutely cannot delegate, like yeah. making the pitch, meeting people, right? Uh, I think I remember asking you also, I was like, can I, can I just get people onto a call? Yeah. Like, <laughs> each other show up. Otherwise, like, you got to, like, the, the grind is a part of it. But um, I think delegating other business critical things, uh, getting my husband to help out with a lot of it also, um, right? Because we were working on product there, we were working on brand. So trying to delegate some of that, uh, started hiring my early team also, earlier than I thought I would have to, just so that all of that could sort of be, be managed. And even in terms of the actual fundraise, right? Um, getting advisors, I wanted to only, kind of, because we were bootstrapped, there wasn't that much money to spend. Um, I wanted to wait to get like a lawyer, bad major shareholders agreement, ban et cetera. Uh, but even to do the early kind of term sheet and all of that, I think it's very much worth the investment to get someone. You don't have to get the most expensive CA in the world, but someone who has some experience doing early stage fundraise, it makes a world of difference because why reinvent that wheel, right? There yeah. are people who yeah. know, ye hi paanch document hai, ye hi char compliance hai. Khud, like do not think of doing it yourself. It is pennywise found foolish. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think some, even I think <coughs> I was told very early that a good lawyer, a good accountant, are absolute over investments that make a lot For of sense. Sure. I completely agree with you. For sure. I think, I think that Rahul at Matrix had told me this. I wonder how many people in this room are founders who have thought about fundraising or raise capital at some point or the other. Ah, very mm. good. We have. I think this is the this is the right <laughs> audience. I wanted to ask you. I wanted to ask you guys a specific, specific question, uh, Nikita and Twinkle. And this might be like very tactical, okay? But I think it's important because the more founders I talk to, the more relevant it is to them. What percentage of your savings? do you put into a company before you start feeling uncomfortable 
about opportunity cost of both capital and time to get to this PMF thing that you and Prachi spoke about. This is a very personal thing. I know. Risk capital. Hence the question. <laughs> but how do you yeah. think about it? Okay, forget about the number. But how, how do you think about it? How do you I, think about it? For me, it was not a percentage of savings necessarily. I think it wasn't ki aadhe chale gaye hai. It was getting to a point where I felt like I need this much to be okay. Having said that, I think there is the privilege of like I I don't have any dependents. I'm not. I don't have kids yet. I'm not supporting my parents. You know, they they manage their own thing. Uh, and my husband is earning, so you know the lights will stay on. We can pay the rent, right? Uh, so all of that I think is is very helpful. Uh, but having said that, there was still there was a number mm. in mind where I was like, "Isse kam agar gaya, the, then I'm going to start feeling super uncomfortable." Okay. So for me, that number was like 15 lakhs. Okay. Uh, based on four and a half years of Mickey's savings, I spent a lot. Yeah. Like a significant multiple of that already. Yeah. So I remember for <coughs> me, I had 50 lakhs in my account when I yeah. left, and there was no salary. And I put all of that into Bombay Shaving Company mentally. All of it done go in one shot. And I didn't transfer it to a bank account. So I made it a loan, kind of it was a loan on uh, uh, to the company from Even my side. I've done that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But mentally what happens is then you start writing checks very quickly. So we mm. first ordered our, I don't know if you, Ritika will probably remember <coughs> if she was uh, if she does, but our first order was 5,000 shaving cream tubes. Mm. Check. I think eight and a half rupees for the tube and 23 rupees conversion hmm. and that was one check that I had to write hmm. and then the second one and yeah. then salaries of three people and then yeah. it just became it ballooned right so you it's easy to bootstrap yeah. especially in businesses where revenues are, are backloaded hmm. yeah but it's very difficult to actually see that money going away and then you start feeling okay. Yeah. And I it's hard to anticipate. Sorry, sorry. No, I was just I was saying it's all it also really depends on your personal situation. Yeah. For example. In our case, we were both both life partners, husband and wife, jumping in and starting a venture. So for us, it was not just about, you know, where will money come to invest in the business? It was about how will we just do the Keep basics? The yeah. Where will rent come from? Where How will we maintain a basic lifestyle that we have? So I think it also depends on your personal situation of how comfortable you are in putting in your life savings. So to be fairly honest, we did not put in a lot of our own personal savings into the business because we realized that our funds are now going to dry up for a long period of time and we need to divert a lot of those funds in our personal expenses because there is no salary coming our way now for a long time. And, uh, and so yeah, we did not put um, a big chunk of savings into the business. That's why we tried to raise as early as possible so that we did not have to put too much personal. And whatever we did was initial to kind of get by to register the company to get to the first set of samples in R&D but post that we did not. So how much have you guys raised this for the audience? I am very privileged to be an investor in both places so thank you both so much but how much have you raised this from a context standpoint? Uh, we've, we've raised five and a half crores. Similar we raised about six crores. Six crores. So this is what is classically a seed round right both businesses have not launched in the market but tremendous efforts have gone in for a few months we have sizable amounts of checks, both Nikita and Twinkle kind of come in with tremendous personal pedigree as well. So they have been able to capture checks uh, and investments from a large number. How many how many investors do you have? We have about 34 investors and then 34. Prachi was very kind to give us a grant as well. Yeah, okay. through Spark. Through Spark. So, for Spark. And what about you? 41. So 35 investors and 41 investors. So guys, you have to think about this. 35 investors, each investor will require a conversation around the idea, around the team, around investment thesis, which is what is the valuation, who else is coming in, um, uh, what are the preferences that we're going to get in terms of rights, and how much am I going to put into your company? Can like, I try the product? Oh, oh really? I couldn't With do that. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't. There is no product right so now. So that is 40, 40 each multiplied by probably five conversations, yeah. which is 200 successful conversations. Not to say maybe the 15, 20 and in some cases where people are coming into a new city or they don't have the networks, that becomes almost 400, 500 conversations if you're going to do an angel round, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so they're right in the sense that it, it is time consuming and rejection plays on your mind a lot. Uh, Rajin, how do you kind of think about uh, choosing between large number of angels and of course I know you're vested in the answer here but <laughs> <laughs> choosing a large number of angels or going with an institutional early state early state check of maybe 100k 200k to maybe even a couple of million which 
a lot of not only venture capital, but you now have family offices, you have you know a lot of syndicates that are right. you know there are now, now options for capital. But how do you think about choosing, given uh, yeah. given that you're you know you're in um, the game? Well, especially at early stages, you know, if you're able to reduce the number of you know meetings as possible, then of course precious you know, time. Yeah, <laughs> precious time. And if you can get back to building, so if you're able to find one or two not institutional investors, just just investors who can speak for maybe larger parts of the round, of course it helps you. Um, but if not, I guess there are um, a lot of um, I'd say micro VCs, angels who also run syndicates. So you don't actually have to go through many many rounds of conversations or pitching to them. Again, there is no right answer to whether you know is X number big or big or small. Um, at at a point when you just want to launch and you want to get back to building, sometimes the right investor for you is the one who is willing to cut you a check. And yeah. so, which just helps you move on and then get back to building. So, no right answer, I guess. Um, we see consumer brands, sort of, you know, or or startups across different sectors raised from different type of angels as well, right? Sometimes they've only raised from a lot of ex founders, such as you know, or founders such as say Shantanu, or they've gone to micro VCs, or they've had uh, you know syndicates. Uh, sort of, uh, you know, help the round put together. But when we are evaluating, say, for example, for the next round, at that point of time, it's just the company and the founder which matters yeah. and nothing else. Um, so yeah, I guess no right answer. So every every founder can sort of make their own cocktail or whatever it works. <laughs> what do you look for in a founder when you, like, because you have very little data to go on. The yeah. businesses are probably infant businesses at best. Sometimes yeah. idea stage, sometimes it's just the founder who has is passionate and is evaluating two three things, right? How do you? And I know a lot of this comes down to judgment and gut and references. But can you go a little deeper, Brachi? At a personal level, I wouldn't ask about how your firm does it, but I want to know how you do it. Right. Which is what do you, what do you look for specifically with such opaque uh, sense of data? So I think at very very early stages, there is there are only two things that you could potentially judge or evaluate. One is the founder. And the other thing is the market, right? And so now let's talk about the most important thing, which is the founder, right? Um, I think the most important thing essentially becomes uh, the founder market fit or the insight which goes behind why they want to start this, right? Uh, now there are two kinds of founders: one which is they face that problem themselves, so they know, okay, boss, you know, I have faced this problem, so that's why I want to solve it, and I'm very passionate about it. And the other type of founder is very like top down. I identified this opportunity, like these legacy brands in it, or this is a category which is growing a lot, and you know I want to build in this. I think within both, both kind of founders can be successful. No right answer, but I think the most important thing is what is the most valuable insight that they have, which probably someone else does not, and maybe that comes from being able to, uh, maybe they've experienced that problem before. Um, or they've probably been able to speak to many stakeholders in the ecosystem, and that gives them that sort of uh, you know understanding. Or they have you know some proprietary access to either some distribution or manufacturing, which helps them gain very sort of unfair advantage to win, mm -hmm. right? Um, I think this is sort of on the you know on the parts of where you know insight and how they feel about you know the market, all of those things come in. But I guess a lot of it is very. I wish I had an answer to this thing of being able to explain, yeah. right? When you sit down with a founder, you yeah. you know sit, uh, sit sit with them for a dinner, lunch, whatever, a, a coffee, drink, whatever it is. There is a certain type of feeling which you know there is a feeling which clicks, uh, which is you know somewhere deep down that you know this person is super passionate and I would be so privileged to be able to work with them. Right, um, and in some ways, uh, life as a VC is very dependent on the kind of founders you'd partner with, right? Um, so I wish I had an answer to explain that feeling. The click. The click. Instinct. Um, and, and that how instinct. How long does the click take? <laughs> no, it is. You know, sometimes it takes maybe a couple of meetings. Sometimes it takes a week. Sometimes it, you you take time to get to know the it's founder. Like finding a life partner. You know, it is. Yeah. It is actually. It's just like it's perfect. Sometimes it's the spark. Like four years of dating, like. You're like, seed stage will get to like series G by that time. <laughs> well, Nobody. we don't have time as much as to <laughs> series G at seed. just know also. There are people yeah. But you're right, everything in business is almost like marriage-like. Yeah, right? yeah. All these partnerships. 
so i guess on the founder piece i guess that and then you know the basic you know things around the market that it should be a large market or should become a large market later and so on but i guess the click is probably the most special and important thing when you're partnering with a founder have you ever had a situation where the click has not happened for you mm-hmm. and the founder has gone on to prove you wrong and you're like so what what did you learn like i love asking professional Great. investors this thing <laughs> how much of, what i walked big, into it how how big is your anti portfolio to the extent uh-huh. that hey i missed out on these four for these reasons and they are very legitimate reasons because you again have very little data but they went on to do something so let me kind of recorrect the way i look at founders and personally i can imagine it to be kind of comfort with a background for example that this mm. person comes with this kind of expertise or yeah. you know speaks articulately about business in a particular way uh, which many times very traditional business folks from india don't I have like the barber shop has given me the opportunity to meet people who if i meet them in any other context i would never imagine them to be just the successful business leaders that they are so we come with biases what biases of yours do you, or, or are you saying that hey the process is so well tuned that it kind of takes care of that in a nice way so it's been about 3 years that i've been you know in the seed business um i'd say in hindsight maybe what i should try and do more of is basically try to uh focus on meeting folks founders more in person you know for the first year and a half or two years we were operating you know out of you know our offices uh, sorry out of our homes um uh, and you know we didn't get to meet people in uh, you know founders in person and and actually meeting people in person and being able to feel that vibe in a way or you know i think has a very different feeling it's very difficult to judge people um you know just through a computer screen for example mm-hmm. right it's very hard to judge ambition understanding and there are so many smaller things around just body language when the person is sitting in the room with you which you know you can't explain but your brain is probably programmed to learn from those actions yeah. um and so uh, whenever i mean this goes both ways so if there is an investor or if there is a founder for you know that's learning from that you really like just take the next flight and then just go and meet them yeah. uh it does make a world of difference yeah. amazing um nikita and twinkle you guys have you know have it's been a nascent journey but still a learn you know high learning one um uh, what what do you solicit from your investors in terms of help beyond capital do you think that they have helped you and did that govern your choice of who will get to invest in your companies or did you just say hey look you have a good reputation as long as you're not giving me black money cash uh, <laughs> capital <laughs> right out, and you come in but or or did you say hey you know what you're going to help me for this you're going to help me for that and then did you kind of select your investors or yeah. uh, what do- i think it's it's very important to select your investors because these are these are folks who will be with you for a long time uh, they are the folks who will encourage you support you in addition to providing capital uh, who will also ask you questions uh, and that's why it's really important to have that that kind of a rubric on who are the kind of people i would like to have on my cap table so number one yes it's definitely important to be selective uh, with who are your investors having said that I think you can't be too selective also because I would also say we shouldn't be letting money go oh, on the yeah. table. So I I think this is there's a balance you need to strike that um you know like is this is this investor someone uh, who I would want to be on my cap table even in my bad times then I think the answer is yes. Um and yes don't leave money on the table. Um at the same time I think it investors your angels are are literally angels like they really <laughs> help you uh in very nascent so nascent kind of stages and very specific examples would be like you know which which photography agency should i hire there's a d2c brand builder who probably knows a good photographer photography agency there's a person who knows a good brand agency you know there's a person who knows uh you know these are the terms you should be you should read on your term sheet very carefully yeah. so i think just uh, the frequently made mistakes kind of like you get to know them and also you do not repeat and reinvent the wheel which a founder or an angel can already help you with also you get great connections i mean angels do help you in introducing you to people and making connections so i think it's it's definitely a mix of both yeah. you completely agree i think our cap table is is a mix we have a lot of you know there's a term uh, fff friends family and fools yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i've been building this for a, for a long time i've been talking about it for 2 years and building for 1 and a half 
so we do have friends, family, and who's also on the cap table, and we we didn't keep like a large minimum check size, so yeah. we got that. But we have a lot of strategic angels also. Uh, I think completely agreed with Twinkle. Um, maybe just a few things to add. One is uh, the most important thing, probably even more than uh, how strategic they are, is a vibe check, um, yeah. or a vibe match, as the kids say. Um, it's like a values level match, right? Are you on the same wavelength? Are they excited about what you're building? Yeah. You don't have to agree on every decision. You're not even going to, like you said, discuss every decision, right? An yeah. angel is the opposite of a shark. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <they're wonderful. laughs> but uh, you you need to feel, it's like, you, even when you hire your uh, founding team, right? Even your employees, I think yeah. it's important to have that vibe match. And other than that, uh, I think the best way to solve this uh, in terms of how people can help, if they've built in a similar category or they have been investors in similar businesses, uh, then they have a really good perspective. Like Twinkle said, they open a lot of doors for you. Uh, if they if they build something that is not too similar to what you've built, uh, I asked everyone, how do you think you can help? Yeah. Right? Uh, how will you help me? And they would say things like, uh, you know, maybe I can introduce you to a few more people who might want to invest. Right? That is the first way in which they help. Yeah. I remember you, Rahul, said uh, we can take interviews for you yeah. if you want us to. Because I, for instance, if I've never done performance marketing, I don't even know what to ask a performance yeah. marketer. Right? So things like that, I think uh, your angels are kind of best positioned to tell you uh, how they'll be able to add value. So I did that in, in every conversation and in a friendly way. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, it's a very interesting thing. <coughs> I used to very shamelessly use my angels. If I have to give a tough message, I actually use the board to do it wow. uh, rather than doing it myself because it saves the relationship in a from an awkward yeah. moment, but also more importantly carries weight. So hmm. I think we, I did not foresee some of the investors playing that role when they came on board seven, eight years back. Yeah. But today, for example, they play roles and it has nothing to do with check size. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we have people who put like a 15 days of their salary because that's all they yeah. had at that time because they were founders themselves. Harpreet Grover, for example, is a Sardar ji. He said, you have saving business and I can't alone. So I went to his house. You know, I went to his house. I kind of, his wife Bhakti made poha for me. I pitched to him and I couldn't like really get through to him because we used to have a razor and all. And he's like, yeah, okay. Then he said, yeah, I can't do it. I just cannot get the vibe. Arpit is the founder of CoCubes. I don't know mm. if you guys know. They sold to Aeon. He's a very, he runs this um, Instagram channel called Being a Curious Parent or something. He's a fantastic guy. But he called me up three days later and said, yeah, uh, abhi tankha hai hai. Toh uska aadha le le. <laughs> so it was the smallest check in our yeah. round. But it was by far uh, wow. the most valuable uh, uh, angel. Uh, yeah. uh, Participation in multiple ways. I completely ways. agree. I think the check size does not matter not at, at all. all. I, I think found an inverse relationship so far. <laughs> we actually did not even keep a minimum check size. We yeah. were like, we will never ask an angel to put in money more than what he or she feels comfortable with. Yeah. Because, uh, I mean, angel investing is, uh, is risky, right? Yeah. So, I think the check size just does not matter I, I in terms of how helpful an angel okay. can be. Uh, I found that people who were building recently, the world has changed a lot after the pandemic for consumer brands. People who have been building in recent times and have been kind of early-ish stage in recent times are the most helpful and ha they have the least money to put into <laughs> an angel check. <laughs> so I was like, I need your advice. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give you skin in the game. Yeah. Uh, and, and people are really helpful, right? They're like, I don't need to have skin in the game. And I'm like, no, but I would like to give you that, right? Because yeah. your advice is like super helpful. This is one thing that I would love the audience to actually take away is, and I don't know how many people here have been founders for a long period of time, but if you have been recent founder, you have started up recently, I think it is very likely that you will underestimate the power of the founder ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And this is a great place for us to get to know each other, but this is one of many. So look at people who have been founders from your places where you worked or in your societies or you yeah. know from school or college or wherever, right? and get together because nobody will understand your pain as much as someone who's gone through it themselves. I think a close second would be investors who invest in early stage founders because death rates of those businesses are very high. So they kind of have seen it at scale. Like they will have multiple data points, but from some distance, but as founders do try to create ecosystems of brotherhood and sisterhood where you can just call up. Virevan Bhatti, for example, is someone who I would just call up randomly to just moan man ki yaar, what the fuck <laughs> Usne aise bola. and then because like in my case strategic investors came very early institutionally mm. so yeah. it was complicated legally right so uh, Revan was, was was a great help is there a way to maybe identify more Harpreets for example like how do you get to them I think reputation matters 
So now you will never have a Harpreet making a first investment in you. Mm. You that person would have made five other investments. And the reason I wanted Harpreet was because I had spoken to founders he had invested in. Mm. So I knew him. In my case, it just didn't match for mm. very different reasons. Mm -hmm. But it eventually came through. So that was great. So mm. when you are evaluating angels, do look at their track record. Now yeah. people who are angel investors are serial angels, right? People yeah. have right 10, 15, 20. Kunal, Shah of the world have written upwards of 200 checks, right? So yeah. um, they have a reputation, uh, and other founders will be very happy to talk about, you know, how how they help. In in general, it's a very positive. Right, do there are founders over here in in the room? Like I told you, Dushri, Sashi, who've been so helpful, right? You ask them any question, uh, and they'll you, you will get more value than you would ever yeah. anticipated when you ask. And on, on using angels well, right? So I keep bumping into Kunal Sudhi yeah. in One Horizon Center. And he's built something completely different, yeah. right? And he tells me also, he always says, he opens with a caveat that I don't know what it's like to build in your, build in your space. And then he gives me like really epic advice. Yeah. Because there are so many things that are common about how to think about hiring, how to think about building, and the thing about moaning, right? Yeah. Like he'll look at the face and he'll be like, Kya ho gaya? <laughs> so much hai. Uh, so he told me at the end of that conversation on when we spoke a couple of weeks ago and he said, you know, something I didn't do well when I raised my angel round was I didn't use the people on my cap table as well as you do. And I was like, no, I, I'm not using the other people well, I just keep running into you. Uh. But clearly, you know, I should. Because every conversation is is super helpful, right? Because there are things that are sector agnostic. Yeah. And, yeah. and it's just hard. Taking decisions, you know, with limited information is hard and he knows what that's like. Yeah. So Kunal, for those for the uninitiated, Kunal Suri was the founder of a company, <laughs> is the founder of a company called SimSim. And at probably the quickest journey from founding a business in 2019 yeah. to selling it to Google in 2021. So it was, I think, 720 days of existence wow. independently before it got acquired. And now Kunal and Saurabh <laughs> work, at, work at Google as well. Um, I wanted to actually open it up to the audience because I'm sure there are a lot of things. And uh, I, I get that there is an indexation of consumer brands here, just given my personal uh, networks and you know uh, uh, on, 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 on the you know on the show. but. I think a lot of the things that are spoken about in terms of how do you think about choosing investors to terms of investment to uh, working with them to quantum I think will be industry agnostic probably not time agnostic because this will probably be relevant for the first couple of years if yeah. you're bootstrapping beyond the first couple of years then I think you're golden okay because what you're doing is you're saying I'm going to index time over capital which by the way is one of the most incredible ways to preserve equity. I think the three, yeah. like I definitely have not done that. The both of you have kind of taken a step towards not doing it, but you might want to hold it now. But those of you who are in the audience and thinking, I'm, I don't want to raise money. I actually love owning my entire business and owning all the profits that come out of it. That's golden, okay? Yeah. Like genuinely people don't talk about it as much, but uh, if you're able to do that and build something sizable uh, and own all of it or a majority chunk of it, it's, it's, it's quite incredible. I, I think Asian Paints is a classical example of a 35,000 crore top line business which is still 52% owned by the by the promoters incredible. despite being public. Mm -hmm. like right? Go Colors. Yeah, Go Colors also. Right? Yeah. Very well done. Um, anyways, show of hands uh, on questions and just kind of go for it. it. There is no wrong question here. Yes? Uh, one question was... You well, could you introduce yourself and what you do and then ask the question? Yes. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, we run like a creative agency but we wanting to scale and do things but this question and also initially raised a round of funding um, despite being a not so scalable business uh, and you talked about the fact that reputation matters, something you said that about the people you pick money from but one thing that I wanted to ask uh, Rachi was that you said that you know when you look for founders you look for the click right so what are some indicators of that click? And uh, Nikita, you mentioned about uh, you mentioned about the white check. So, just trying to get a sense of what does that really mean. Like, I'll start with Sasha. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for the question. Um, I would say um, the outcome or the understanding that any investor <laughs> wants out of you know interacting with anybody. And by the way, this also should exist on the other side. As a founder, you should also judge your investors and you know sort of have that kind of understanding. But um, through whatever those <coughs> interactions are, what we're trying to understand is, one, how passionate or dedicated is this entrepreneur, right? Um, second is how much of an understanding does this person have 
of the market. Um, are they in it to build this for the long term, right? Um, and I think these two, three things around just dedication, uh, understanding of the market, um, and matching of values, right? Which is building it the right way. I think those are the few things that you want to try and understand. And the way maybe we try to sort of understand that for ourselves is probably um, uh, asking them about their past experiences, why they made like certain switches in say jobs or why they made certain decisions, right? Uh, what is their motivation to start up? A lot of these things around how they speak about, you know, their past sort of jobs or decisions, it gives you a sense of how motivated this person is, how devoted this person would be to building the company. I think these are the few things that you want to sort of as an investor want to at least get comfort on. Um, and this could be many things. So one is interacting with the founder. I might also try and ask him or her on, you know, hey, is there someone from your past employer I can speak with, right? Uh, I think your past manager, your colleagues are, you know, best sort of position to be able to also vouch for you. So those are few things that, uh, you know, which could probably be characterized as the click. And before I give it to Nikita, I, I completely agree with her. I think as, I, as she was talking, the one thing that comes to me, and it is not just about founder investor, it is also about sometimes finding a co-founder. It is also sometimes when it's in a senior hiring discussion that you're looking for a click, right? Yeah. For me, the proxy for a click is when you start completing each other's sentences. And I see this very, very often. Like the moment you get a vibe check, you start seeing yeah. the person's thinking, saying what I'm thinking before I'm saying it. And that's, you know that, okay, you're home. <laughs> then you, of course, Prachi, like things around value checks and yeah. so on, you have to be, be sure about that stuff. But that's the first indicator that you guys will get along is when wavelengths match where you start completing each other's sentences. Kunal and Saurabh do this a lot, by the way. But on the phone, I can't make out the difference. Their voices sound similar. <laughs> so I'm like, that's too much. But uh, it, 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 sorry, she asked you a question on the vibe check. Yeah. So, vibe check, that, yes, that yes. Was so I'll, I'll have to give you, I'll digress for a bit. I'll give you a little bit of context on why this was so important for me. Uh, so uh, uh, my, my brand, Moxie, we are building uh, in a very, we are a very purpose-led brand. Right? I didn't, people start up for different reasons. I didn't like scan the GDP and like, I wouldn't <laughs> be building a hair care brand. I'd go into Web3 or something, right? So we exist for one reason alone, and that is to make sure that our girls never have to grow up feeling like their natural hair is ugly or is not good enough. Mm -hmm. So I talk about that a lot during my pitch. Um, I, I think, so we want to build excellent products that are kind of made for Indian people. Global products never are. Uh, nor do they show it. I think there is, there's a product part to it and there's also the imagery. It's very Eurocentric and I think it is only a little better. I, I put it in the same category as Ferris creams in a way. right? So I feel very strongly about this. Um, and I talk about it a lot. And there are people that don't get it. Yeah. right? And they'll be like, but shampoo to bahut hai. Why don't you think about starting an e-commerce portal? Yeah. Abhi aap, aap crypto mein kyun ghuste and all of that. Right? So that's a massive red flag. And having said that, I'm not opposed to pivoting. Like I will do what it takes to build an incredible brand because I want to, I want to have impact, right? It's, uh, if the question is on, do you want to build a business for four people and, and be happy? That's not an investable business. Uh, I want to build something that is very impactful. But I will pivot based on what my consumer wants, what young women in India want, young people in India, but, but women to start with. Um, and if people are not excited or moved by that, then they're not going to understand, they're not going to have the patience that I need them to have, right? So I think given that context, the moment people would be like, why don't you think about Web3? I'd be like, all right, <laughs> this, is, this is not going to work, right? So I mean, that's a very extreme example, but I think even otherwise, the kinds of questions people ask, uh, I'm happy to talk about the business and at an early stage, I think what Prachi and Shantanu were also saying, there aren't really any numbers to look at, we haven't started selling yet. I can tell you what the plan is, uh, but I definitely also need you to, to at least at some level understand what, what we're trying to do because while we are trying to build a large business, we are also trying to solve a problem and I've had investors ask me things like, and someone from a fund, from a, a top fund asked me, not that I was trying to pick up fund money, he asked, um, are you trying to solve like for a mission or are you trying to build a very large economic engine? And I was like, I, I don't understand why these two things have to be mutually exclusive. 
Um, I don't think unless you are solving a deep problem, you can ever build a sustainable large economic engine. Mm. And I think there is a right way to build it. And if, if you don't have the patience for that and you see these as disassociated things, uh, thank you and have a good day. Right? So uh, I, feel, I feel strongly about it. Sorry, long answer. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. I'll just add to that actually. And one of the things um, you know, I've learned through, you know, of course, a lot of us Spark founders, especially you know, at early stages is that all founders have to, or I mean, you guys can speak better at, uh, at this, is that um, there's a lot of sales which happens in every part yeah. of your life as a founder. You're also you're selling to your, maybe you're selling your product, of course, you're selling your product. Uh, second is you're selling to get people on board on your team. So you're selling there. And then you're also in, maybe in the first few meetings, you're also selling to an investor to be able to get them on board. And so and the less. The soul also, like a little. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, or maybe not. Sure. Um, and so, um, so the less you can, you have to do the selling is more you can actually, you know, put your energy behind doing the right things around building. And so, being actually very aligned with your investor. If you don't have to sell to another person that you're going to essentially be working with for a long period of time. So, if there is alignment in yeah. vision and you, and the mission. You know, that just makes your journey a lot more easier, right? And, and this is, a lot of times founders think, hey, you know, investors are the ones who probably have the capital. So if they say yes, then, you know, I, I want to just go ahead and partner with them. But you should definitely have like a nice strict check about the kind of people yeah. you want to be working with. Uh, you know, you're going to spend a few hours a month with them. Um, and so that's, that, that, that's a good amount of time and, and that too over a la long period of time. Awesome. Yes. one thing which is a deal breaker when it comes to you know really investing or you know putting yourself behind something what would that be? <laughs> I can take that. It's very easy answer. Right? Anyone who has had the whiff of having done things that are wrong like founders who have stolen, yeah. uh, oh, people God. who have been unfair to employees, yeah. um, uh, investors who have rescinded uh, a commitment which had reached a particular place without a reasonable reason. So for example, if diligence falls through, that's completely fine. Yeah. But to send it for other reasons that don't make sense. So any bad form of this nature, either way, some founders display it, investors display it, employees display it. If there is history of this in the past, and I look for it, by the way, uh, it's, the conversation is a non-starter. So yeah. for me, that's it. It's, I, it and there no other, there's no other deal breaker, honestly. I think for me, it's just basic respect. I think all of the partnerships are equal partnerships in a business, whether you get an investor on board, uh, whether you're hiring someone, whether you're just, you know, partnering with an agency. So for me, if I, if I feel that I did not feel respected in a particular conversation or situation, I think it's not healthy to go ahead with that because it will somehow come back later in some form. So respect is like the biggest thing for me, how, it's like how, a deal breaker. How do you, uh, sorry, I'm just going to, when you say respect, does like, can you qualify that in a particular, is, is it behavioral, is it? I think it's mostly behavioral because see, I, I wouldn't want to confuse respect with feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, people have, uh, I think you should always be open to feedback, that's the only way we grow. Uh, but there's a way of delivering feedback, there's a way there's body language, uh, there is also how much of the feedback is facts versus judgment. So I, I, I think for me, I think again it all, it's all, it all comes to like vibe, instinct and gut. But if your gut is saying that you know, I, it was all fine but I just did not feel respected or I did not feel, um, I did not feel like uh, the best version of myself when I was in the meeting room, meeting room then I think it's a, it's a deal breaker. I completely agree with you. In fact, Siddha and I were in a fundraising situation a year and a half back. I don't know if Siddhas, I don't know where she is, but uh, we were talking through a discussion. Uh, this was, and I'll name them here, but we were with and one of their partners was sitting in a circle, like one of those rotating chairs. And when the introductions of the team were going on, there were four or five people. He was rotating in his chair and like kind of looking here and there, and then he kind of cut someone off, went to the <laughs> curtain and said, look at the view. And this express stars. 
Like we, our offices here, we know the view, right? So, like, really. But anyways, uh, the issue was within the first ten minutes. For me, the deal was never going to happen. Mm. Uh, and we told our bankers we were this is a banker run process, etc. So, I felt like we need to shut the laptops and leave. But we kind of respected the decorum of the room and the institution because it's a fantastic institution. The behavior of one individual on one day should not define it. But Unfortunately, the outcome of that is that the investment would never happen. So, respect is a deal breaker. Sorry. Um, I think <laughs> <laughs> I have to look at him, so I guess I have to answer. No, no, it's okay. I, 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 <laughs> we can, we can I guess we said for each of you, what is a deal breaker? Um, okay. In the process, at least, you know, uh, I would agree with what Shantanu mentioned around, um, you know, past values, you know, experiences, all of those things, respect. Just in the process, I would say, um, it's also, um, you know, something is to be said about how authentic the founder is. Um, and, you know, of course, when you're on a stage, when you're, you know, doing a podcast, there's some, of course, we, you know, we're, I, this is not how I sit and speak when I'm in my living room. But posturing to such an extent where uh, you're probably representing something that the company is not, the numbers are not. Um, and one small example about this would be that, um, and of course, I understand because fundraising is hard that a lot of founders think, hey, let me create a little bit of FOMO in the process. When I say it, it's still like, you know, last stage of the process. You have to give me a decision now quickly, right? Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, the, the VC ecosystem is very tiny. Yeah. And so everyone's like, uh, you know, they're able to check whether or not this is happening, right? And so if anyone gets to know about this, you know, so quickly, you know, you feel like, you know, besides all the other aspects of the business, you end up, you know, feeling a little bad about, you know, the founder lying to you a little bit on that aspect. So uh, I think the broader message is about being authentic, of course. Uh, but you know that the posturing piece, of course, you know, we have to be a certain way when you're presenting, speaking about the business, all of that. But just make sure or making sure that you're the right representation of the business and who you are or what the process is also very important. It's also very easy to see through, actually. Huh? It's also very easy thing. to see. Yeah, it's very easy to see through. Now. <laughs> like I've also done it, by the way. So guilty as charged uh -huh. because you told. Ki if you have three, four interested people, expedite them because they get it done as fast as possible. So, how do you do it? So, get everyone over the line by saying the other person's closer or whatever, right? Yeah. But you're right. It's easy to see through, so I kind of stopped doing it after a while. I have gotten this advice. I mean, I wasn't talking to funds, so people were like, FOMO is a rule. But clearly, I think today I've learned that that's, that's not a good yeah, idea. Um, I think nothing significant to add, really. Respect is, is the only one, right? I think. Very few conversations where we are fortunate where I felt after the first discussion, unless you know that just wasn't the vibe check, where the person is not necessarily disrespectful, they just are on a different wavelength, uh, is when people are kind of rude or you know, there's sometimes the power dynamic is a little awkward uh, where people are like, you know, you should come to me with more preparation and all that, and it's a relationship of equals. And I, I would like to talk about this. Uh, because I think it is gendered, right? A lot of yeah. what you discussed with Vinita Singh in, in one of your barbershop episodes. Um, there is, I, I think, I mean, people sometimes, and bad form, as Shantanu said, if they behave as though, you know, they are uh, doing you a favor, uh, that's not cool. But I think early on, I felt like they were doing me a favor. So, and this is, this is definitely gendered, right? It's one thing to, uh, one muscle to build is to hustle intros, right? Like write that cold email, like I at one point was asking my friends, apne company ke CEO ka email ID de do, mujhe likhna hai. What have you got to lose, right? So one muscle is just finding ways on the spectrum from warm intro to cold email. But the other is having the confidence to do it. I think uh, a lot of us women especially, we feel like, like who am I, how can I? Right? I got Bhavi Shagarwal's number and I sat with it for weeks and I was like, should I send this, right? What's the worst thing that will happen? And he responded saying, very nice deck, but I don't do angel investments. Uh, so I was like, cool, but you know, what, what is that to lose? But I think that confidence, um, it's a coaching chat that you had with me, and I don't know if you recall, but I remember Shantanu saying that, you know, uh, you, you have to have a mindset change. Nobody is doing you a favor. Are you asking them to take a chance on you? Yes. But it's not charity, right? It is an investment. You are going to build a great business, you're going to grow their wealth. So the way to look at it is not I am going and asking, uh, I'm, I'm going with a request. It is I'm going with an opportunity, right? This is a great opportunity for you. 
uh, and that mindset just was an absolute game changer for me and I felt so much more confident like if I'd see someone that I vaguely recognized uh, to walk up to them and be like hey I'm building this business and can I have your number and I, I'd love to set up time to talk to you it's not something I could have done I think before that conversation where I realized that there is there is just as much for them to gain, right? And the language you use in the barbershop of equity seekers and yeah. um, just everyone being, it's a, it's a partnership. Um, I, I didn't have that starting out. And I think a lot of women founders that I speak to uh, also don't. I, I remember speaking to someone who was, who was at Sequoia previously mm -hmm. and uh, she was raising and, and I was asking her, you know, have you reached out to XYZ people uh, who we knew in common? And she said, no, I've never met them in person. So that's like so awkward. How can I? <laughs> I was like, why not? Like, they're wonderful people. I've worked with them, um, you know, and I'm, I'm sure your idea is fantastic. You are, you're, you have the right network for this. You're, you're super hardworking. I know they'd be interested. Um, so why are you feeling uncomfortable about this? And then I, like, I paid it forward and I, like, I did your pep talk. And I, I don't know, I don't know if, she, if she did the outreach eventually. Uh, but I just, I wanted to share that. I know it's not exactly a response to, to your question, but uh, it just, I think the thing about respect got me thinking that while the investor should not behave, be behaving as though, you know, they, they own you, uh, you also need to kind of give yourself, um, like, know, know the worth of what you are bringing to the table and not be like, you know, please, uh, because <laughs> that's, uh, that's not the truth of it, right? Uh, there, there's an opportunity for them. Awesome. Yes. Wow. Okay. So we, we, have, we have a lot of questions. I don't want people to not ask questions. A lot of questions we'll cover over. I think we'll be here socially as yeah. well, but we'll want to, we'll go through them quickly. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, hey guys, my name is Shivani and we are building Prepod, uh, India's first edtech platform. Uh, so, we are looking into investing in Prepod and we are building a But I have a lot of feeling that I have to say that I have to say that I underestimate to say that I have I'm glad that I have to say I have tried another uh, this, uh, breakfast stuff uh, with uh, co founders, female co founders, and uh, this is amazing. Uh, okay, this is amazing. This is amazing. And you uh, have to say that you have to Yeah, so my personal experience was that uh, while I was pitching them, no uh, interest in their And uh, they didn't ask any question. After 15 minutes, uh, one of them said, uh, problem kya solve kar And I was like, damn, abhi tak nahi nahi hai, 15 minutes baad. And um, in another pitch, I realized that uh, when one of my co-founder was there, they were interacting like anything. I don't know if it was because of that in India there was a lot of male interaction in India, that's why they had their confidence that they didn't ask me a question. But I thought that personally. So Prachi, how many pictures of you have to be a female entrepreneur for the pitch? Or the gender ratio is a lot of hit here. So the first question is there. And the second question you all have is that many startups आइडिया के बेसिस पे पैसा उठा लेते हैं, वेरेस कुछ ऐसे होते हैं जो बिल्ड भी कर लेते हैं, स्टिल दे स्ट्रगल एंड बीसी कर लाए कि इतना रेवेन्यू हो जाएगा तो बता देना। तो फिर जब हम रेवेन्यू और प्रॉफिट खुद से कर लेंगे, तो हम बीसी का क्या करेंगे? I love that question. Good one. So on at least the number of Teams that have female founders, I would say we are far from being 50-50. Uh, um, you know, there was uh, there were some statistics that uh, a, a couple of years when I was uh, at business school, we were doing some study which said that only 4% of the entire venture capital pool went to female founded startups, right? Can you imagine, like just 4%, right? So the number is obviously far from where we'd want it to be and there is a long way to go. Um, I'd say it's a lot less than half today. 
um, maybe you know we can chat offline i can share more experience in case you know you know what that number looked like for uh, you know past few months but uh, and that is also the reason why you know twinkle was a part of uh, the spark program uh, which is a fellowship program specifically for female founders and what you mentioned about <coughs> the breakfast club or you know the event that you went to i think the community piece really does help right uh, and finding like minded folks and maybe in 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 some of these cases like minded folks could be other female founders is very important and to be able to find that tribe so it could be through such programs like i think bloom also runs this uh, vani of kalari also runs an amazing cxxo initiative i think all of these events and more such initiatives thanks shantanu for also putting this together are actually amazing places to be able to find that tribe um, and i know i would say not only as founders i feel like just as a professional also right uh, be surrounded by more uh, you know women is is definitely something that i would say is a much better place to be um, so yeah i mean i don't know if that answered your question maybe we'll chat offline more on uh, what what's the speak like Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, who is sitting like uh, on the pitch with you? And <coughs> some founder who is the male. He has been like treating the other co-investor who is male some differently. Mm-hmm. Like you That's know, getting more involved. That's yeah. a very interesting question. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> I I just want to understand that because I've been also facing this a lot uh, on the other forums. Means means being women, you are actually not taken seriously, and the kind of the effort that you. Um, you have to do proving a point is four times higher than a man equivalent in your position has to do right i would say in pitch meeting specifically uh, i have felt fortunately it's been i have felt that it, it was equitable um and this also probably is a function of just a relationship between an investor and a founder yeah. right uh, the founder is pitching to a fund but not specifically to me mm-hmm. right um, and so that could be a caveat but have been fortunate enough on that front i would also say a lot of my colleagues right uh, even if the question or the founder deflects toward answering to them right my colleagues would you know instantly say you know prachi her actually leads most of our xyz investments and you know she'll be the you know so there is a lot of also responsibility on people around you yeah. I feel yeah. to true. be able to make sure that it is equitable, and so fortunate on that, uh, especially on the team that I am, that I get to experience that. Though I I will say that uh, the kind of relationships that you build and the kind of effort which is needed could be different, mm-hmm. right? So I work with both kind of teams where there are female founders, there are mix, and there are only male founders, right? And the kind of relationships that I would have with each. are not to say that are, are better or worse but they are just different right um so one of our first investments actually was animal this is a, 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 a you know both the co the five team uh, but the ceo and ceo is um are women so the relationship that i have with neetu and kirti actually is very different i would say now it's also been 3 years is i would say is very different as compared to maybe the other relationships that i'd have That's a very interesting point. Yes, yeah, someone in the back had raised their hands. Uh, Hi, good evening. Can I? Yeah. yeah. Hi, good evening. So my question is a follow-up question to you. The limited answer I have: the person who being a founder who is into just I should say your career, and you go to an angel investor, but would a VC be interested to fund? And second, if so, what's the benchmark? What's your name, sorry? Manasvi. Sorry. Manasvi. Manu, I think Prachi can take that, yeah. but can I give one like one thing for everyone here? I think women in general, and I might, you might agree or disagree with me, but I, this is a very strong point of view. I think women underball themselves a lot more than men do, all else equal. So, con- like, consciously try to not do it. For example, in your sentence, I would not say with my limited knowledge at all. So language defines mindset, attitude, behavior. If you say limited knowledge, you believe it, and then so will the other person, and then your baseline is different. So with the exhaustive point of view that you have, <laughs> I would like to ask you to answer the question. So the answer is yes. 
um, but again, every VC has a different risk appetite. You know, and that's why every VC has certain stages. Everyone's like, okay, no, we'll only do Series A onward, Series B onward, we only do like pre-seed, etc. So you will find the kind that you're looking for as per stage. And there are enough and more venture capitalists, solo capitalists, angels, micro VCs, all of these folks in the ecosystem. Right? Uh, but a good place to start, especially if you're in ideation phase, could also be looking uh, toward folks you've worked with before. So for a lot of folks sitting here, it could be that your first checks came from either your friends, family, Ooh, or the managers, yeah, 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 senior managers, all of these folks that you've worked with, right? Because they know you from before. So with the idea, they can also underwrite you as a founder. So that's also a good place to start. On the benchmark thing, again, no right answer. Um, and, you know, uh, I wish maybe I can, maybe the, whatever you're working on, we can chat offline and I can maybe give uh, with that color, I can tell you more about benchmarks. But, you know, it would goes anywhere from, you know, zero, which is pre-launch and just maybe the product is there to about uh, maybe even, you know, a million or two, uh, depending on the sector. Right? Uh, for software, it's very different. CPG, it's different. Maybe for B2B businesses, it's very different. So hard to put one benchmark for all type of companies. Awesome. People who are raising hands while sitting, I can only see hands go up. So I cannot even see <laughs> who I got. Just whoever, just ask yeah. whatever. So I'm Marshall Park from Google. Oh, I think most of you know about the company. Marshall community with 41,000 plus women, uh, very popular in NCR. Um, so very interesting conversation and congratulations to you all. We do have a large number of uh, entrepreneurs inside the community. Uh, my question is, uh, you know, uh, when you go to uh, seeking investors, so how much of information do you share? I mean, how do you choose what you should share and what should you not? Yeah, I think that's a fantastic question. I that would be a great uh, <laughs> you know, guidance for many of us. Can I answer that? And you guys should also do it, but... Because for all of you, I think you have invented, created something new. So it's not easy that you go around, especially when you're going to take a large number of investors. I'm sure you would have uh, met many more uh, to shortlist those 41 and 36. So what is the red flag? How should we go about it? My strong belief on this is there is absolutely no downside to oversharing. There is only upside to sharing your story. Investors typically, very few times if at all, would take your ideas, have the brains to copy them, then pass <laughs> it on to a competitor who will then think they are good ideas, who will then execute them, even half as good as you. It's not going to happen. But the upside is if you tell your story with flavor of numbers, insights, whatever it is that you think is telling the story of Good Gama Moms, the chances are you excite the person with the maximum chance, who will then go and tell 10 people, what is Shubha kya kar rahe? dude, it's amazing. And then you don't have to do the pitching at all. Because once you tell a great story with all the flavor, the pitching kind of happens in Myself. the background. right? So sometimes founders will request an NDA to be signed. And investors in general, well-reputed investors, have absolutely no incentive to copy or take notes and give it to a portfolio company where it will be useful. We all think this, all founders think this in their heads very early. Ki yaar, mera hai idea hai, copy ho jayega, kuch nahi hota so very, I, I think it's, I might be wrong also, but my personal, I to, whatever I tell investors, I tell in the press, I tell on the barber shop, I don't care. Like because, unless by the way, unless you're a tech company where for example, like there's IP or there is there a part of your yeah. code which is very, very like patentable and so on, only in those very specific cases you should not share. I'd like get ironclad NDAs and consequence management for that. Otherwise, it's fine. I think yeah. I'd uh, I would like to just add to that. I think there was something that we were talking about earlier where uh, you know you need to be on the same page as the investor. Uh, so being as honest as you can be is very helpful in terms of having the same expectations, right? Prachi spoke about expectation alignment. Uh, so being super transparent uh, is helpful. I think where the the place that I would draw the line, I completely agree with Shantanu, is IP, right? If there is something that um, if it's code or like in, in our business, you know, it's formulations or it's formulator yeah. maybe or things like that, right, which are very, very precious, like which are absolutely at the core. Maybe you don't want to share that. Uh, if the, and the investor will not ask you for that also because they, they don't want you to disclose anything that is IP or that is kind of the source of your IP. Mm. Other than that, you should absolutely tell the entire story. And if it scares somebody off, you don't want them on your cap table anyway, <laughs> right? Because <laughs> there's going to be ups and downs. So a mature investor 
will not be scared off by um, you know the the truth of building a business. Hopefully, they'll know that that's how it goes. Uh, but it it just helps. Like alignment is is super important. Yeah, I think uh, I think two things. <coughs> One, really, I think I'm realizing this more and more. Everyone used to tell me this, but it is building a business is all about execution. Yes. It's very little to do with True. the idea right. and <coughs> everything to do with the execution. <coughs> there are there are like thousand small decisions that we will probably be making on a daily basis and the culmination of all of that is what builds the business and not just the idea and and I, I understand where you come from because I think in the early stages I was very protective about you know should I even be talking about this idea should I talk about my uh, my industry should I talk about the the kind of products I'm going to build you know feel very protective mm. but then I think a lot of people kind of guided me at that point that the more you share the more you'll iterate and the more you'll learn so the version should I continue what? That's fine. The episode will have like a dark moment of it. <laughs> Good. Good. First thing was execution, but the second thing is all about really improving the version of your existing thinking. So the more the number of people that I spoke with, I realized that I really iterated and improved my idea. The kind of questions they asked. Sometimes I was like, oh, why did I not think about this? So I think those are the two things: execution. No one can copy. And uh, your idea just keeps getting better the more number of people you speak with. Of course, IP exception. <laughs> yeah, we'll have a couple of questions and then we can kind of move into like food yeah, and drinks. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, for Nikita and uh, Twinkle, Twinkle, the question is, you know, startup founders, they're hustlers. You have to hustle every day, day in, day out. Even while you're sleeping, you're hustling. So what is it that you do to bring that calmness back into your life? So that next day you can get up and go out in the same energy. Um, honest answer, I, life is not calm right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm still trying to figure it out. Like it's it's one of those things, you know, I know I should start going to the gym. I know I should, you know, get a therapist. Uh, you know, you you keep putting it off. Uh, so I, I haven't cracked it. Uh, I, I also, I think I have poor boundaries. So I'm trying to solve that. So I don't, I don't have an answer for you. I think... Uh, for me personally, staying calm and wellness is extremely important given we are building a wellness company. So I think just a few tactical tips. One, I do try to exercise at least three to four times a week. I'll not say it's that easy, but I think it's a very important uh, metric of whether my week was nice. So my week, uh, week success just does not depend on whether I had great meetings or did I do something great at work. But now I feel a little bad if I don't exercise four times a week. So, of course, identify what you like the most. But I, I do feel that exercise has that meditative effect on you. And it really kind of helps calm you down. And then the second thing as entrepreneurs, you know, we have this urge uh, or itch to work weekends. And I think I made a conscious call that I'm in it for a really long time. I'm, I'm going to be doing this for decades. So I do not want to burn out. So I think for me, having weekends off is a very, uh, is, is, is a conscious choice I've made right from the beginning that I'm not going to work weekends unless it's absolutely necessary. But yeah, I think those are the two kind of important things. I think it's all, you never do it perfectly. But I think just having it as a priority and trying to do it even imperfectly uh, takes is at least one step forward. I think that helps me be a little bit saner than usual. How to handle the FOMO in such case? <laughs> Sorry? How to handle FOMO, FOMO in such case? Yeah, I think a lot of FOMO is very, uh, very Instagram driven. <laughs> so I, I, I genuinely, I think the times where I'm <coughs> feeling most FOMO or I'm not feeling so great or it's not been the greatest week, on during those weeks I try to stay off Instagram because I do not want additional triggers telling me that someone's having an amazing vacation, someone's probably, you know, doing I better than I am. And glorifying that. Yeah, yeah, people who are slogging on weekends and glorifying it on Instagram yeah. are not slogging. Slog. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry, you you're gonna ask a question. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, Hi, please. I'm Sachi and I run a new age sexual wellness brand called That Sassy Thing. Uh, we've 
been bootstrapping for two years and now we're in the fundraising mode. Um, so my question is actually linked to what you were talking about, Nikita, about self-doubt as women. Um, yeah. How do you guys handle rejection? Don't sit with that thought, talk about it, right? Talk about it to friends, mentors, partner, you know, whoever. Uh, and that will help you kind of remove your ego from the situation and realize that typically rejection happens because of a mismatch in maybe someone, um, their thesis doesn't match yours uh, and things like that. It's hardly ever a judgment on your self-worth, but it's very hard. And as women, I think self-doubt is, is definitely, it is definitely a more gender thing. Uh, so I, I do tend to go there, but then I, I think when I talk to my husband or you know, a colleague or, or, a, or an advisor, they kind of help me understand that it isn't that there is something that you are lacking or that you're not good enough. It's that it wasn't, it wasn't the right fit, right? And uh, it's for the best if things haven't worked out when they were not the right fit. So I think just talking about it um, is the only way to, uh, to pull yourself kind of out, of, out of that weird zone that you go into and get that perspective again that it's, it's, it's not personal. Awesome. I, I, I think. Hi guys, I have a question. Just a quick one for everyone. Hold your thought. Sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Yes, yes, very much. Uh, so I'm Himani. I come from, of course, India Network. We are a VC team for the startup and love to talk to any of you in the room. But I just want to ask you a question. What would be in the first 15 seconds if you judge, like you're sitting in a room, you have somebody coming and presenting to you, pitching to you. In 15 seconds, what is it that you see? I mean, does a decision take place in those first 15, 20 seconds? Or do you wait through? I mean, I just wanted to get that. So, Prachi, I'm assuming. Yeah. Thanks, Bo. I mean, uh, honestly, like, in the first 15 seconds or even 15 minutes, it's too short a time, I would say, uh, to be able to judge or to, you know, build an opinion. It, it does take at least, for me, it takes at least two to three meetings to be able to get to you know, some sort of decision. Um, and I think as, um, and, and maybe you will also relate to it, is that I think one of the things I've been able to, I've had to unlearn and also sort of uh, educate myself is that I was an operator before. And so you have a very deterministic mindset, right? You have to yeah. make a decision or not. Uh, this is right, this is wrong, right? Uh, but as maybe now in this role, uh, I have to be more probabilistic, which is it is possible that I may be wrong, I may be right, but I need more time to basically be able to prove out one way or the other. So that is my thinking more going into it. So it does take two, three, two, three meetings. First 15 seconds or first 15 minutes, honestly, is maybe too short at least for me. Hi, I'm Juni. And I run a, you know, a data tech product for Vitubia, where we capture the Canada experiences. I have a question when I'm going and uh, pitching for investor. There's one doubt which scares me is what if the investor starts uh, giving their opinions about my business and starts, you know, uh, making decisions for us, maybe trying to influence us with their mindset. So how do you deal with that? You know, that uh, what if the investor starts running my own business? So what if they start giving their opinions on our business? Why Not my pitching, once you are into the uh, you have the yeah, uh, I, I can take that and maybe you guys should answer as well. Uh, my strong view is nobody and investors understand this well. Nobody understands the business and the intricacies of the business the way founders do for the first three, four years. Okay. After an investor founder relationship is maybe four or five years old, maybe a senior set of colleagues who have been in the business and have built it out are there then I think information that is enough to take calls that are pivotal to the company start flowing into people outside the founders and I think everyone gets this so if you feel that someone is disagreeing with you or giving you opinions about your business just remember that that is an additional input for you to take the best call Okay, it is not even if someone dis like I have disagreements with my board all the time, but it doesn't mean that they run the company. It just means that they're giving giving me one of ten inputs. Mm -hmm. My senior team will give me an input. They will give me an input. Customers will give you input. A distributor will give you an input, and they might align with you. They might not. Your job is to consolidate all of that in a meaningful way as a founder, and take the best call, putting your company first always. And trust me, 
for a long period of time, at least for me, for maybe four or five years, I realized and people told me this explicitly, what I'm telling you, that no one will know what's best for your company other than you. That's the unfortunate weight that you have to carry for some time. Just treat this as, as an input. Wow. It's okay. It's okay for disagreement to happen. Yeah, like, just take it as an input. All right, we have one last question, then we like kind of open it. I have two questions. My first question is, as a founder who's trying to build a product in the alcohol industry, how important it is for me to figure out the regulations and the regulations in this industry before I go ahead and get my first round? And secondly, as someone who's just graduated, how important it is for me to first have an MBA to sort of have a positive influence on my investors? So answer to question one is yes, very important. <laughs> Number two is MBA is not needed. Uh, you do not need uh, any sort of degree or any sort of experience particularly to be able to prove that you're the best fit to build that business. All you need essentially is you know the few things that we spoke in the, uh, earlier in the podcast one which is good insight about you know why this product uh, is needed in the market today and your dedication and understanding probably of the market that is all um, but I, I would also suggest that you should also try and surround yourself with you know builders people who actually uh, you know built in this space before right try to build that network so that you are able to at least um, you know you will end up making mistakes but they won't be expensive mistakes one suggestion I would have we, I don't know whether you saw we saw we did an investment in a company called Woodsman which is affordable Whiskey, whiskey, right? whiskey. Shivam Ginglani is the founder. I'll connect you to him separately. But um, one thing you should know is, of course, regulation is crucial. Distribution uh, cliques are very, very strong. Mm. Government lobbies are very, very strong. It's a, there's a reason why alcohol is a difficult business to distribute. Okay, So understand that well. You're fresh out of college. You're starting a new company. So please make sure you do that. So on regulation plus what are the power centers of, 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 of distribution, right? That's one. Second is, other than Bira, private capital in alcohol is tricky because there are always LPs who will have, who no. won't want. So for example, after Bira, I don't know, there's not been any venture capital investment and for a good in reason alcohol, yeah. in alcohol because LPs have that bar that like education funds, endowments, you know, pension funds, etc. will say we don't want to invest in alcohol, for example, right? Or tobacco, for yeah, example. Yeah. Um, and that's fine because that's just values for them. So you have to understand what pool of capital is available to you. You also need to know that private equity, for example, large private equity. So look at any blue chip private equity fund in India. Typically, their LPs will in fact even have a higher stringent to say you cannot invest in any company where, for example, alcohol or wherever, where even any other part of the supply chain, I cannot have a portfolio company in any part of the world which makes it so much more difficult to get access to private equity, you know, above $100 million, for example, right? So it is a tough, you will need money. It's regulation. Distribution power centers are very difficult. Having said that, because it's difficult, sometimes the pot of gold is very, very, very big, right? So you will always have strategic investors. You have large companies like AB InBev, Diageo, uh, you know, Perno, etc., who have their own investment arms. But identify pools of capital before you jump into this, because it's, it's not a straightforward answer. We'll talk to Shivam for sure. Awesome. Cool. Uh, Prachi, Twinkle, Nikita, I'm hoping you guys are hanging around for dinner yes. and for drinks and so yeah. on so you guys will get access. Um, but thank you so much guys for being such an involved audience. Sorry about the electricity break and for the ACs to switch off and all that. And uh, you know, this is the first time we're doing it. I know that maybe some of you are uncomfortable, but uh, uh, you know, do give us feedback. But thank you for being an amazing audience. Thank you so much. But I think the party starts now.